Okay, well, fantastic. <clears throat> Gary, thanks. Every, needless to say, it's been a dribble of people coming in. <clears throat> and for those of you who are not familiar with Seattle traffic, yes, it's always bad, but not usually this bad. Um, I think we're ranked, what, fifth worst in the country, something like that. And uh, it just takes one motorcycle to end the whole deal. Um, well, listen, thank you so much uh, for coming, and good morning, and uh, we had a nice reception last night. Thank, thanks so many for, for joining us. We also had the diplomatic community come, council generals, and so on. It was really terrific. Um, this program is one in a long series now that we do on energy issues. Uh, we've been doing these things for years. Uh, we have the Pacific Energy Summit, which <clears throat> travels around annually to different capitals. Um, we've had an energy security uh, program, annual program in Washington, D.C. for many, many years. And, um, and it's always uh, an opportunity for us when there's this <clears throat> combination of national interest, transportation um, and the production side and transportation, together with, uh, with Asian interests, consumers. And so this is a, this is a big deal. It's a complicated world. Um, I, I often think of energy like health. There is such a public interest that it is not a simple political or, or economic or financial <laughs> process to do anything. That's kind of the understatement I know of the century. So it's terribly complicated. And on top of that, we've had we're at the trough in a, in a business cycle on the energy production side that, you know, we know this is what energy is all about. It goes sky high, it goes terribly low, and it's difficult. Two weeks ago, I was in Alberta at something called the Global Business Forum. They've been, they're in a recession there, you can imagine, because of their distance from markets. They're the first hit when the prices collapse. And uh, <clears throat> so they're, they're, uh, they were upset, upset up there about Keystone. They're upset, um, wondering what their future is. And of course, for them, transportation location are huge. For for us in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we're really a hub. Uh, we're really a, a transit point, and to kind of make things work if they can. And and I says, I said, boy, is it is it a uh, a complex process. But anyway, thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, this is, energy is one of the main things we do, as I said, and, and many of you have come from uh, great distances. I have to say that so many of the things we do, um, and in the wake of the triple disaster in Japan, our Japanese partners are so important. Um, they've had to completely look at, as, a, as, as an energy consumer, enormous energy consumer, they've had to completely recalibrate uh, how they're going to, how they're fueling their country. And obviously North America in this regard uh, can and should play a very important role. So I want to uh, point out, same thing with Korea. Uh, Korea had, didn't have a, a disaster like anything like that, but Korea sits in a uh, strategically vulnerable uh, area and has to import its energy. So our Korean partners uh, are so important. China, um, the, 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 the mega consumer uh, out there, of course, is consuming and, and sourcing 360 degrees. Uh, Russia, Middle East, uh, wherever it can get um, uh, energy, <clears throat> they're part of this, this um, calculation, enormous part of this calculation. So given that milieu, uh, we do have the, have the potential here in the Northwest to, to fit in in a very important way. Again, we'll be talking about that. So thank you so much, uh, all of you, for coming. Um, we have an incredible uh, lineup of special speakers, uh, no less than, I'd, I'd love to introduce you, uh, Gary, but Slate will do it, but you'll have fun. How many, how many titles? Could a young man like you have? <laughs> Any case, but first I want to turn this over to, to Senator Gordon. Um, well, you know, there's some of us here. 
Crete, by the way, lives south of Seattle, so we don't know oh, when yeah. she's going to arrive. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> Cree Agnew, and Cree is the president of the Gordon Center, and I worked for Slade a few decades ago in his first term um, as U.S. Senator, already in mid, well into his career, for those of you who know him. Uh, in any case, uh, just to mention a couple things about Slade since his Senate career, uh, unfortunately, very shortly uh, after uh, returning to the state uh, from Washington, D.C., 9-11 took place. And in, in fashioning the 9-11 Commission, um, which is, as you know, the shortened name for um, the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, when they, when they tried to form the 9-11 Commission, this was, of course, national news, I think one of the first appoint, attempted appointments was Henry Kissinger. But he wouldn't, chairman. yeah, as chairman, he wouldn't divulge any kind of conflicts of interest. So, so in the end, he didn't stick. And I think there was one other who didn't stick. Slade was the first appointment to the commission to stick, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they finally found a Boy Scout. Didn't have anything to disclose. I know. He didn't. <laughs> they finally found a Boy Scout. Uh, but anyway, extraordinary um, uh, experience of of Slade's on the 9-11 Commission. He played such a critical role there. Um, that, of course, a, a jillion things in the interim, but of interest uh, recently served on the Commission on the Theft of American Intellectual Property, which has had an enormous impact on, um, on how we're trying to approach and actually use leverage to defend um, our companies and individuals' intellectual property. And this played a very prominent role, the legislation that passed as a consequence of the commission, played a very prominent role in Xi Jinping's visit, the lead up to the visit, and, and we presume uh, following. Anyway, just by, you know, you could, I can name a million other things that you've worked with you on, Gary, with your governor, worked with uh, um, on, you know, transportation, but also the redistricting. Slade's resume goes on and on, but Slade, let me just turn it over to you with that. Thanks, Reg. Brief introduction. And uh, welcome to a slightly tardy <laughs> beginning of a, what will be a most interesting discussion on, on uh, Asian energy uh, policies. Uh, we have uh, uh, Ambassador Locke, uh, we'll have former Congressman uh, Norm Dix, and we have NBR's own Mike uh, Herbert to uh, lead a discussion uh, on a vitally important uh, subject. Now, anyone looking at Gary Locke realizes that he's not of European heritage. <laughs> Nevertheless, I believe Gary Locke epitomizes the expression Renaissance man. <laughs> Gary has been a part, a vital part of this community and of the national community for his entire adult life, starting in the Washington State Legislature uh, with a time as King County Executive, a two-term uh, governor of the state of Washington, retiring undefeated, untied, and unscored upon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of Commerce in Washington, D.C., ambassador to China, and yet returning to the place from which he started, and now in, uh, in, in the private sector. Few, if any, citizens of the state of Washington uh, have uh, had a more varied career or have done more for their community and uh, for and, and, and for the country as a, as a whole. As he mentioned as he sat down here, the last time he was here at NBR uh, was for the Gordon Center and he was an inspiring speaker to the group of students uh, that we had here at that time. And that typifies that he is willing to go to large groups or small groups and to share his experiences and his faith, uh, and his faith in his country. So that uh, uh, <coughs> that perhaps is enough of an introduction. But I simply have to tell you how delighted I am. I'm among those who have been recruited by Gary Locke to do the <laughs> kind of things that he wants done. Uh, and uh, uh, Gary is an individual to whom it is almost impossible to say no. <laughs> does, Thank Mona, you. does Mona agree with that? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me just uh, acknowledge Senator Gordon. Uh, 
uh, for our foreign visitors and, and those from not not from this community. Uh, Senator Gordon has just been one of the icons of Washington State politics for such a long time. Long time in the Washington State Legislature and then in the um, uh, Washington State Attorney General where he really distinguished himself and really made it a crusade to focus on consumer rights and consumer protection. Then, of course, he went on to the United States Senate, where he was really known as a true nonpartisan, a person who really believed in collaboration and consensus building. And quite frankly, Washington, D.C., um, you know, we here in this Washington always call this the better Washington, the real Washington, <laughs> the real Washington. And uh, unfortunately, the other Washington really could benefit from that continued wisdom and perspective and uh, a sense of focusing on the nation. Um, and, and that's what I think it misses. Uh, I have actually had to uh, say yes to Senator Gordon on so many different issues. And so I, I don't think it was really the other way around. But he's also one of the, the people who saved uh, Major League Baseball uh, for our community and really helped uh, uh, engineer some of the uh, uh, agreements between uh, uh, Nintendo and uh, of the owners uh, of the Mariners to make sure that even though it's minority, majority Japanese ownership, that nonetheless, that uh, they could really truly be a part of our community. And so we actually teamed together, teamed up on some of those issues uh, and also on getting a new stadium for the Mariners and everything else. And so it's always been a pleasure working with Senator mm -hmm. Gordon. Um, with respect to the topic of, of, uh, of uh, energy in uh, North America and Asia, and especially trade. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert on this topic, and I've read some of the reports and publications put out by the National Bureau, and I find them very, very fascinating and very illuminating. Um, and you all are the experts about what that all means, and so I, I, I think that what I can do is just offer you uh, uh, a perspective from China, where I've traveled a lot uh, over the last several years within China, and have lived there for just a few years uh, during my term as ambassador. Uh, but I think my perspective and observations of what's happening in China is in some ways reflective of the challenges and the needs of all of the Asia Pacific region. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I believe these challenges also mean great opportunities for trade, energy trade from America. And I mean energy trade in its most broadest context, not just the movement of commodities and natural resources, but in terms of services as well. And I think uh, I'd like to draw on just, Cree, come on in. Come on in, Cree. <laughs> you just beat me by a few minutes anyway. No, Cree, we started six or seven minutes ago. Yeah. I can't even tell you what a disaster this was. Um, <laughs> Morning, everyone. Speaking in two. Okay. Um, and, and I'd like to just focus on one experience uh, within China that I think really uh, crystallizes uh, everything about the energy picture of not just China, but also uh, the Asian Pacific. Shortly after I was elected governor, uh, I went on our first trade mission, uh, and it was to Japan and then to China. And at the end of that trip, uh, in 1997, October of 1997, my mother and father, my brothers and sisters met us all in Hong Kong, and from there we went to the family village. My mom and dad had not been to the family village, the village where he was born, where his grandfather and great-grandparents were born. Mom and dad had not been back to the family village in more than 50 years since their wedding. And uh, so we go back to the family village, but to get to the family village, we, uh, we go by hydrofoil uh, from Hong Kong, past Macau, up the Pearl River. And then we uh, land in a big city of a couple million people. And then from there, there's a motorcade that takes us to the family village. And it's almost like the, the cities of, of, of uh, Europe where suddenly you have the demarcation, the walls of the city, and then suddenly you're in the countryside. So we left this, the walls of the city of, of several million people. And we're now in the countryside, and we're traveling about a mile and a half on a dirt road that was actually recently repaired, kind of fixed up a little bit uh, for our arrival. And they had hundreds of kids in school uniforms waving pom-poms along the roadside. And we passed the, the rice fields, 
with water buffalo, and it was like, and once we got to the family village, a mile and a half from a city of millions of people, it was really like stepping back into the 1800s. The same house where my grand, where my dad was born and where my grandfathers were born. No, uh, no toilets. Uh, some homes had running water. Uh, each home in, in the room that we went into, the, the family house, had a light bulb hanging from a cord, and one light bulb from every room. And in the back is, is where they cooked, um, using wood kindling, coal briquettes, maybe a, a little uh, uh, electric cooktop, and that was it. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I... Uh, and they have very, very small refrigerators, almost like what you might find in an office or in a college dormitory, those small two feet by two feet, uh, maybe three cubic foot uh, 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 refrigerators. Which is, this is how 47 to 45% of the population of China live. This was not an anomaly. This is typical China. 45 to 47% of the people of China live in rural, parts of the country under these very same conditions. And the question that always strikes me is where would China get the energy, the electricity it needs so that the people in the countryside could have a decent sized refrigerator, not a big refrigerator like we experience in America, but even a, you know, a decent sized refrigerator, maybe three times larger. Or where would they get the electricity if people in the countryside were ever to have a washing machine because they wash everything by hand. Uh, or where would they get the electricity for a microwave oven? We went back uh, to the family village in uh, 2007, and again, nothing had really changed. We'll spiffed up a little bit. Uh, as ambassador, I've been back in 2011 and 2014 and brought my uh, children to see the family village so they could really understand how fortunate we are to be Westerners and to live in America, but also to see uh, and experience the life of, of their ancestors. Um, where, where would China get the electricity it needs to raise the standard of living for the people of the countryside just to be on par with uh, the people in the urban parts of China, the sprawling, gleaming cities, or even what we have here in America? And then again, where would China get the electricity it needs for the cities that it's building, these mega cities that it plans to build, let alone the new industries of China? You know, as, as, China, uh, uh, as China grows, the demand for electricity is going to grow. In fact, it's estimated that the electricity demand will grow by 46% over the next five years and will need to double by 2030, and that's according to the International Energy Agency. Now, China right now uses, um, gets, uh, depends on coal for two-thirds of its energy. Two-thirds of its energy comes from coal. That's more than any other G20 country except for South Africa. And the emerging middle class of China is now increasingly uh, outspoken about living in sooty cities that are oftentimes reminiscent of Oliver Twist's England in the 1880s. I mean, the Chinese people now are obsessed with PM 2.5. That's particulate matter smaller than 2.5 microns. And it's a very obscure measurement that is now widely known in China. I mean, people in China know about PM 2.5. This is the really nasty, tiny, microscopic stuff that if it gets into your bloodstream, really is detrimental uh, to your health. In fact, uh, it's been estimated by Chinese and American doctors and scientists that there are 8,000 premature deaths in, uh, per year in northern China because of the pollution compared to the south. And uh, there are... You know, we have monitors on the U.S. Embassy in Beijing and on all of our consulates measuring PM 2.5. And the Chinese government refused to measure it. They were measuring it, but not revealing the results. They were always measuring the really nat, the big, big sooty stuff, but not the microscopic stuff. And then they tried to get the embassy to shut down uh, our, our uh, measurements and told us to stop disseminating that information. Uh, but as Slade knows, if we have information that we're making available to the residents and the workers, employees of the embassy or the consulate, so they can decide whether or not to allow their kids to go outside and play. 
we have an obligation under federal law to reveal it to the entire American community in that particular country. So we were disseminating on our websites. Chinese government did not want us to do that. And then we had influential bloggers who, some of them have 20 million of their own followers on their Twitter accounts, it's called Weibo in China, who were then retweeting or rebroadcasting our measurements. So the public of China was beginning to understand how severe this stuff really was. And this was not just, um, not, not, not just fog outside. And many schools would actually shut down all sporting activities if the measurements exceeded 150. Routinely in Beijing, the measurements were 300, 500, sometimes 800. Oftentimes you could not see across the street because the air pollution of PM 2.5 was so nasty and so bad. So partly in response to the hue and cry, and in fact there have been violent protests throughout China by its citizens, the Chinese leaders have now embraced a cleaner energy, a cleaner environment, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But they also recognize that they need to diversify their energy mix and supply, and perhaps doing so for security reasons and not just environmental reasons as well. As China tries to reduce its proportion of energy from coal, I mean, it's going to continue to build more coal-powered uh, electricity plants, but it's going to try to reduce the proportion in the future coming from coal as it tries to meet the energy needs of its people. China will have to turn, and is now turning more to oil, to gas, and renewables. And with President Xi's agreement with President Obama last November to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions come even bigger daunting challenges. Uh, President Xi's promise to cap carbon emissions by 2030 and to have 20% of China's energy come from renew renewables that is estimated by some to cost China some $2 trillion. And some have said the, this pledge would require 67 times more nuclear power, 30 times more, or, or 30 times more solar power, or nine times more wind power. And put it another way, that would mean that China would need a total of either 1,000 nuclear reactors, or 500,000 wind turbines, or 50,000 solar farms just to meet this pledge by President Xi. Now China is already the world's largest producer of wind and solar, but China really is having a great amount of difficulty managing its existing renewables. I mean, more than 10% of its wind capacity a year ago went unused because of constraints uh, with, the, with its grid system. And in fact, China often can't get the power it generates, regardless of the source, from one part of China to the other part of China. Uh, now China has achieved some uh, miraculous feats in the past. Hundreds of millions of people have been lifted uh, out of poverty. Uh, it, it's built these <coughs> gleaming modern cities. It's built thousands and thousands of miles of bullet trains, high-speed bullet trains. But central planning has has not always been uh, perfect. It's uh, It's gone awry with deadly consequences in the past, like the Great Leap Forward and even the Cultural Revolution. So I, it remains to be seen whether or not China can accomplish this, uh, uh, or meet the challenge that's set out by President Xi Jinping. China is the world's largest consumer and buyer of energy. But, it, uh, but what it does to diversify its energy mix also, quite frankly, has geopolitical consequences. In 2013, China got 52% uh, of its crude oil from the Middle East. Korea got 87% of its crude oil from the Middle East. In 2014, Japan got 84% of its crude oil from the Middle East. And so as China and as uh, much of Asia Pacific moves from coal, uh, but with the low cost of oil, and now, of course, the availability of oil from Iran, now that uh, sanctions are being lifted. Um, what will China's diplomatic, strategic, economic, and military policies be with respect to the security and the stability of the Middle East? It depends so much of its oil from the Middle East, and given the turmoil there, what will China and some of the other Asian countries do with respect to policies there to ensure a steady flow of supply from the Middle East? <coughs> China cannot build enough power plants fast enough to meet the energy needs and the demands of its people, whether it's powered by coal, nuclear, hydro, or solar. Uh, but as it produces the energy now, uh, 
uh, it must also do so with an eye toward reducing greenhouse gases. America can definitely help China achieve its goals. We have LNG that we want to export. We have a lot of technology that we can share, whether it's in environmental uh, efficiency, um, as well as environmental cleanup. Uh, and uh, we also have expertise with respect to shale development. I mean, China has a great potential for shale. It's much more problematic, much more difficult to explore and tap. Uh, but that's where American know-how and technology can, can help. And of course, we have oil, that, uh, an abundance of oil. China's needs are thus opportunities for not just the companies of the Pacific Northwest, but indeed throughout all of America. And quite frankly, we need China to succeed in this Herculean endeavor, which is really has great consequences for the entire world and certainly for the planet itself. So I, I look forward to your conversations today. Thank you. Yeah, Slate, I think, but uh, it'd be, it'd be uh, great if we maybe, Mike, where's Mike? I, we, do we go right into the, any, well, any questions? Yeah, maybe. If, For Gary initially, a little discussion, or then we can just move wanna, on to Mike? Anybody want to ask, talk to the governor about well, do this? Well, why don't you make a comment, Mike, and that'd be as a transition. Well, like, you know, in, in uh, I'd, I'd just say I'd compliment the governor for someone who doesn't know much about energy. <laughs> that was a pretty darn good energy briefing uh, for Asia, so I, I'd, I'd have a hard time duplicating that myself. So, uh, I, you know, I, I think you put your finger really on the, vi the vital linchpin of the issues in China, and that is coal and air pollution. And how China can move towards a cleaner energy mix uh, as fast as possible, but still meet these rising energy consumption needs. And that's the real uh, challenge for the leadership. I, I, I use the, the analogy, it's like driving 80 miles an hour down the freeway and trying to change your tire while you're still driving 80 miles an hour. It's very dangerous and you're very likely to crash. Uh, and so I think that's a lot of the challenge that uh, China faces today. And um, it's not well appreciated, I think, uh, in many places, how difficult this is going to be for China. Um, so I, I guess with that, uh, you know, just some, some commentary, I think that is really at the heart of China's energy dilemmas. Energy security is obviously a critical uh, concern for the leadership. And another point the governor made, which I think is really important, this dependence on Middle East oil, uh, Beijing's dependence on, you know, gets, it's, it's a 60-60 problem, they call it. 60% of their oil is imported, 60% of that comes from the Middle East. Uh, and that's only going to increase uh, for a whole set of reasons for China and for Asia. So I think one of the questions uh, geopolitically is uh, what role will China play in the Middle East? Uh, will it play from a U.S. perspective a constructive role in trying to uh, uh, help support stability, particularly in the Persian Gulf region, which is so critical? Uh, does the U.S. want China to play a role in the Middle East? Yeah, obviously, there's a lot of ambivalence uh, in Washington about is that a good idea or not. My own view is it is a good idea. And it, it, uh, if the U.S. and China could collaborate more on stability in the region, that would be a, a terrifically important development, uh, as well as the stability and security of the sea lanes going from the Persian Gulf to Northeast Asia. Uh, this is going to be a critical set of problems, these congested and increasingly contested sea lanes of the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, the Straits of Malacca, the East China Sea, territorial issues. Uh, I was just at a meeting in Singapore uh, talking about China's growing maritime power and the implications for the sea lanes and security of the sea lanes. Uh, so I think that's another critical uh, issue where the U.S. and China collaboration would be extremely important. 
but it's going to take a lot of creative diplomacy on the part of both the U.S. Uh, and China and the rest of Northeast Asia, Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, uh, India, uh, all have to play a role in, in uh, creating a more secure set of energy sea lanes uh, and work towards more stability in the Middle East. So I, I, I second virtually everything you, you uh, pointed to in your discussion.